All right, welcome everyone. My name is Dwight Duffy, and in this online lecture, I'm going to be elaborating on what I think are some of the key concepts and ideas from Chapter 1 and Chapter 3 of the Shelley Cashman Discovering Computers 2016 book. If you're following along in an earlier edition of the book, circa 2012 to 2015, most of what we cover in this lecture is found in Chapter 1. I'd like to emphasize that online lectures are not intended to replace independent reading or independent study um, of the chapters in the Shelley Cashman book. Also, if you're watching this lecture as part of an online or hybrid class, you probably have a companion worksheet that you need to be working along with, so you may want to pause and make sure that you have that available to you. We are not I'd like to emphasize planning to go through um, all of these PowerPoint slides. I'm going to um, just look at a handful of these slides and we want this to be um, a uh, conversational um, or discussion of the important concepts and ideas in Chapter 1 and Chapter 3. So I uh, hope you enjoy this discussion. Um, this is not formally um, <clears throat> organized. Um, I, have a, I have an outline here of, of ideas that I want to make sure that we cover and we will uh, frequently um, detour from the Shelley Cashman book um, as we discuss the important ideas that are here in uh, chapters 1 and chapters, uh, chapters uh, 1 and 3 of the book. Alright, so one of the main themes um, that's introduced in the Shelley Cashman book is this notion of digital literacy or computer literacy. The importance of knowing about computers and how computers work as being citizens of a technology world uh, that we live in. And I think that that's an important idea and certainly one of the um, goals of this course and one of the goals of the books. Uh, I'd like to detour right away here and introduce an idea that I think is important that I like to introduce uh, to my uh, introduction to computer students uh, and that is this notion of <clears throat> digital Im immigrants and digital natives. So I'm going to type digital natives and you'll see that Google already knows that I may be talking about digital um, natives and digital immigrants. It's an interesting idea um, and <clears throat> It's an idea that's been around for 15 years, actually. And if I can find the main article um, written by Mark Prinsky, the seminal work on the impact of technology. This was written nearly 15 years ago, but I think it's very much relevant today. Um, and I want you to think about where you fit you know, in this digital native, digital immigrant continuum. My guess is most of uh, you are digital uh, natives. You have grown up in this land of computers and technology. Um, I know I was an immigrant to, um, to computers, but I was fairly young. I was in elementary school uh, when I first saw a computer, but I did not grow up with computers in my hands like my kids have grown up. Um, and it's certainly not like my dad, uh, who's 95 now, who didn't see his first computer until he was, you know, well into his uh, 50s. So uh, your mileage will vary uh, depending on, um, you know, largely your age. But this notion that society has shifted and that we have now a, a generation of, of users who are native to technology but yet we still have um, people that are um, immigrants to this land of technology, I think is an important concept. Um, if I elaborate on this just a little bit, I'm going to blow this up. And remember, this is 15 years ago, but think about how relevant this is today. A really big discontinuity um, has taken place. One might even call it a singularity, an event which changes things so fundamentally that there is absolutely no going back. This so-called singularity is the arrival and rapid dissemination of digital technology in the last decades of the 20th century. Goes on to talk about how uh, today's students um, spend more time on TV and video games than they do reading. I think a lot of you would probably find that that was the case in, in, in your um, experience. <clears throat> um, there was uh, a reference to 
NGen or NetGen and Digital Gen. We don't really hear that so much anymore. Uh, but Digital Natives, I think, is a useful idea. Um, um, students today are native speakers of the digital language of computers, video games, and the internet. And so what does that make the rest of us, those of us who were not born into digital world but have <clears throat> at some later point in our lives become fascinated by or, or and adopted um, aspects of the new technology? Um, <clears throat> and we call those people digital immigrants. Okay, so and and you may you may find that uh, reading this article um, to be um, an interesting. It's not a long article, um, but from two thousand and one. And just as an aside here, if I think about my own personal experience with computers, and think about your experience with computers, I um, saw my first computer when I was in sixth grade. I took a class um, in at UCR Extension, just a, a summer program for kids. And I was so enthralled. Um, when I was in eighth grade, I bought my first computer, which was an Atari 400. Had a membrane keyboard. The amazing thing about <clears throat> this computer uh, was it had 16K. And this was circa 1980, 16K. I would say a modern computer today might have, you know, arguably even 16 gigabytes, which would make today's computer have 1 million times more memory than the computer that I used in 1980. A million times more uh, technology. But this was, for me, really the first computer that was, you know, available right there at the you know at that transition from the 1970s to 1980s and you know before this it really wasn't practical to have a computer at home and so people that kind of went across that threshold um, were probably going to be um, digital uh, immigrants okay so <clears throat> moving on into um, the the ideas here in chapter one I'm going to go back here to the PowerPoint The main definition for a computer is a computer is an electronic device operating under the control of instructions stored in its own memory that accepts data, we call that input, it processes that data into information which we call output. Along the way there may be some storage, um, there may be some communication uh, to other systems, but this is essentially what a computer system is. Data goes in, it's processed, and information comes out. We have a name for this, um, a formal name for this that's not in the book that I think is important. And that is the information processing cycle. And if we Google for that, information processing cycle, this is a very well established idea in which data goes in, input, it's processed into information which is the output. Data and information is stored along the way and we may see as part of this model communication to other systems. But there are literally thousands of illustrations that basically elaborate this same concept that an information system inputs data, it processes the data into information which is output. Um, <clears throat> that output may become input to another system. We, we store data and information along the way. So uh, we'd like everybody to be familiar with that expression, the information processing cycle, as having those four main phases, input, processing, storage, and output, but also including um, communication as part of that information processing cycle. So if we think of computers in that regard, uh, something like a personal computer, <coughs> personal computer, which we're all I think familiar with, 
Um, obviously the keyboard is input, the monitor is output, the hard drive is storage, the processing unit is inside the, you know, the system unit. On the motherboard there may be a network card or other uh, communication capability. This would be hold true for a laptop or for um, even a cell phone if you think about it. Um, <clears throat> so traditional computers obviously follow the information processing cycle. But what about other, um, you know, other systems? What about like an ATM machine? Uh, we, we've all used an ATM. Is that a computer system um, in the you know in the traditional definition of following the information processing cycle? What is the uh, what is the input in an ATM system? We input our card, and um, a mag stripe reader reads the magnetic stripe on the card. You input a pin. Um, information displays on the screen, which is output. Uh, processing and calculations occur. Your balance is brought up from storage. Your balance is updated when you do a withdrawal. Uh, communication occurs to the central computer system. So the ATM system follows all of the right phases of the information processing cycle. What about a car alarm um, <clears throat> system? Car alarm system, uh, a lot of electronics. You have your little key fob that you put on your key ring. The buttons that you press are input. Uh, what would be the other forms of input in a car alarm system? The sensors, right, that sense the glass breaking or the door opening, those would be input sensors. What would be the output? The horn that blares on your car. What would be communication? Maybe it, you know, calls your cell phone and lets you know that something has happened. Or maybe there's a beep and that would be a form of output. So systems that are not necessarily you know traditional personal computers or servers or supercomputers also follow the information processing cycle so we want to emphasize that in in chapter one here <clears throat> all right so moving on here to uh, the slide eight so we have this flow of data being transformed into information where value is added in the middle through processing and then storage um, and communication may occur uh, as well. And so that makes up what we refer to as the information processing cycle. Okay. Um, <clears throat> again, the emphasis here, uh, memory, storage, storage devices as, as part of the information processing cycle uh, is emphasized in chapter one. Also the notion that a computer system consists of hardware and all of those components that we see as far as input and output and storage and, and processing, those all require hardware. But a computer system also requires some sort of program or software. And that software can be categorized as either system software, like an operating system or a, a programming language or a utility, or the actual applications that run on the computer, which we refer to as application software. So that's another idea that's, that's um, emphasized in Chapter 1. So who uses um, technology? Everyone does. It's ubiquitous. Um, ubiquitous means everywhere. And so I think it's a little bit meaningless to try to, to make a, a box or a bubble for every user of technology because it's so ubiquitous and it's so widespread. But obviously the usual suspects, education, government, retail, finance, healthcare, science, travel, manufacturing, etc. And then it's possible to describe computer users as home users or mobile users or power users or enterprise users again probably not the most useful distinction as everybody uses computers now and I think a lot of people you know they may be a mobile user and a home user and a power user and an enterprise user and they move between roles so uh, again I wouldn't emphasize that but that's something that we talk about in chapter one okay so that's the big picture again a computer is a um, going back to, I think it was slide five here, 
just so we have our definition, a computer is an electronic device operating under the control of instructions, which is the software stored in its own memory, right, that accepts data, data goes in, it's processed into a useful form, which is then output, and that output uh, we refer to as information. And the formal system that, that, that follows this, we refer to as the information processing cycle. So that's that's the that's the essential um, ideas from chapter one and then don't forget um, <clears throat> digital natives are, are people that have grown up with computers have never known anything other than computers and technology and digital immigrants um, are people that have um, immigrated to this uh, wondrous land of technology and computers okay so let's move on to chapter three if we're in the, uh, if we're, so we're going to skip chapter two for now, which is on um, internet and the World Wide Web, and we'll come back to chapter two um, in, a, in, a, in a later lecture. Uh, but we want to move on to chapter three, which um, is computers and mobile devices. And we want to um, <clears throat> emphasize one main idea here from, uh, from this chapter. And if I can find the right slide, it will be helpful. Bear with me for just a second here. I thought I'd written that down. I don't want to have to go through all these. I should be able to visualize it here. All right. So um, <clears throat> the big idea in chapter three is this notion of categories of computers. And we want to talk about that for a bit because you know, it's a simple thing to say, and it really encompasses the world of computers. So six main categories that experts like to classify computers into. There's a few that have been left out that I'd like to, to, um, to not forget. But personal computers, I think we all know what those are. The desktop computer that you um, are most likely using to actually watch this lecture, although you might be on a mobile device. We have mobile computers and mobile devices. Game consoles are so ubiquitous in so many homes that that has been included as a category. Uh, we all know the game consoles as the Wii or the Xbox or the Sony PlayStation. Um, I think that um, I would add a category or combine um, consoles to include um, streaming and media servers, home media servers, things like an Apple TV, a Roku, a Chromecast, um, Amazon Fire TV. I think that's going to be a, a important trend whereas it used to be the Xbox or the PlayStation that was the primary device connected to the television I think in the future it's going to be some sort of a hybrid device that also does streaming and all already we see Xboxes and PlayStations you know being able to play DVDs and being able to stream movies so we're seeing that I think convergence already but um, I, I would add uh, media servers there with game consoles and then we have the category of servers and servers have sort of um, inherited the earth. Uh, we used to talk about mainframes and mini computers, and now everything is referred to as a server. And um, <clears throat> servers, of course, can be anything from a single server to, you know, to huge um, buildings or server farms. Um, I think the way that that I think about servers is, you know, this idea of the server farm rows of cabinets with processors in them. Notice there's no keyboards or monitors, but there's storage and processing that occurs in these huge server farms. This would be a very sort of a typical kind of view. I'm just going to click through a few of these pictures. And if you think about iTunes, where you think about here they're building one if you think about um, uh, Netflix or Facebook or Google or Yahoo uh, any of these internet services they depend and run on these uh, on these huge server farms uh, that are distributed around uh, distributed around the country and around the world even supercomputers now are um, 
consists mostly of servers. So servers have really inherited the world. We, we talk a lot about cloud computing and, and the fact that you know you can store with Dropbox your stuff in the cloud. You can run applications like the creative, you know, Adobe Creative Cloud that keeps getting updated from the cloud. All of this is made possible by servers. Okay, so if we come back here to our, our slide, I don't want to forget about mainframes and mini computers because that's been such an important part of history and so I just want to take a moment uh, to talk about mainframes and mini computers. Uh, when we talk about mainframes I'm thinking about you know like an IBM 360. This was the sort of workhorse room size computer <coughs> that uh, we used to see very typical the big storage arrays processing units now you we see why we call them units because you know they look like you know big HVAC units <clears throat> any room size computer the biggest computers were referred to as mainframe computers so even the first um, digital computer the ENIAC again room size vacuum tubes we'd refer to this as a mainframe computer the other category of computer that's been sort of lost is the mini computer. And I'm just going to pick a PDP-11, a, a Digital Equipment Corporation PDP-11. This is kind of what I um, went to college using. Um, not obviously, I didn't own it, but it was something that was available to, to us. And these were uh, computers that you know, had these terminals connected to them. They weren't room size, but they were something that would, you know, fit in a room and uh, maybe be beside your desk. And um, they're smaller than the mainframe computers. And for a long time, mini computers were what most small and medium sized businesses could afford. And then the big Fortune 500 companies were the ones that could afford to have the mainframe computers and the government um, agencies. Okay, so moving on through the, through the list of categories of computers. Supercomputers then are the fastest computers on the planet and I think this is really an interesting um, interesting topic uh, to, to think about. Where are we with supercomputing uh, power? <clears throat> and um, one of the best sites for this is top500.org which is a list of the 500 fastest supercomputers on the planet and it's updated twice a year and let's take a look at the list number one fastest supercomputer on the planet <clears throat> as of this time is the National Supercomputer Center in China so China has actually taken over the number one spot notice they're running a United States Intel chip and the key is there's 3 million cores running. So we have massively parallel. We have 33,000 teraflops. That's trillions of floating point operations per second. United States is number two and three. Japan is number four. So we definitely see, you know, an ascendancy of, of Asia coming in. Um, but other countries, it's, it's becoming multinational. It's Switzerland, Saudi Arabia, Germany are all um, now um, playing in the supercomputing uh, space. <clears throat> if we Google for this, Wikipedia, supercomputers, wiki. Let's just look at some of these charts, see if I can. Uh, this is interesting. Um, supercomputer share by countries as of June 2014. You can see the United States is roughly half of the supercomputers on the planet. So when we talk about this idea of the digital divide later, which is the kind of the, the gap between the haves and the have-nots, or the the divide between those that have and don't have even though the United States has just a very small fraction of the world's population like less than five percent of the world's population we control probably close to half of the supercomputing power in the in the world so um, <clears throat> interesting to, to kind of see where that's located geographically geospatially 
Okay. So that's the that's the the notion of supercomputers. The last um, idea from chapter three um, <clears throat> that we want to um, talk about is this notion of embedded computer systems. And it turns out that there are more embedded computer systems than there are probably all the other computer systems combined by far. By embedded we mean the computers that are built into your car, into your TV, into your you know air conditioning unit, to your washer and dryer, into your coffee machine, into your microwave, the medical devices. Embedded systems are everywhere. Anything that has a chip in it and notice it still follows the information processing cycle. It still has input, still has output, still has storage and communication capabilities. It's just that it's embedded into something like an ATM machine or you know, into a, um, a smart weapon system. So embedded computers, <clears throat> what we want to emphasize here is that embedded computers are very much still a computer and they still follow the information processing cycle. So if I were to think of just a few embedded uh, systems, and I'm just sort of picking a few here just for kind of random here, um, you know, a sprinkler controller, if you think about the, 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 the little box that controls the sprinkler system at your work or at your home that has a chip in it, Right, it has some dials that you can move, which are the input, and then it controls, you know, the digital valves, right? And so those signals that turn the valves on and off, those that's output. Um, it can remember the, you know, what days and times um, things need to go on to. All of that, right, follows the information processing cycle. Um, what about an LCD monitor or TV? LCD uh, monitor controller board, right? Anything like a TV or a printer has a, a card in it, a board in it that handles the right, handles the processing for that particular device. So in a way, even the input and output devices and storage devices that we uh, traditionally think of are actually computer systems in their own right. Um, they have input and they have output. Um, what about a smart key? Most cars now use smart keys. Right, it has a chip in it. The buttons on your key fob are input. Um, so anything with a chip, what about, you know, electronic locks? Those can now be um, smart devices. And there is this notion or idea of the inter net of things and the internet of things is this notion that more and more things are going to now be part of the internet your car is going to be part of the internet your washing machine or dryer or your refrigerator your air conditioning unit your garage door the lights in your house um, all of these things right are part of the internet of things and it's expected that this is going to you know dwarf every other type of you know or category of computing device so I like that notion of the internet of things of course it brings up all kinds of issues of security and privacy um, <clears throat> as we think about that um, <clears throat> But I, I, do, I do think this is an important concept, um, the idea that now chips are getting cheap enough and small enough that they can be built into just about anything. All right, so I think that that just about uh, covers, so you can see in, in, in the chapter on, um, in chapter three, where we talked about categories of computers, Personal computers, mobile computers, game consoles, if, if we could add in media, uh, streaming uh, media servers like the Roku and Apple TV, I would feel a little bit better. Uh, we know what a server, server farm is. Supercomputers are the fastest computers. By the way, supercomputers are used for weather simulation. They're used um, a lot in, in nuclear weapon testing. In other words, we can't test a real nuclear weapon, but we can simulate a nuclear um, device or weapon and so a lot of the computing power in that area is dedicated to that. Financial simulations, um, environmental uh, simulations, those sorts of things are increasingly used. Um, applications are used um, 
in supercomputing. And then, of course, embedded computer systems are ubiquitous and everywhere. So I think taken together, if we realize that these categories of computers do follow the information processing uh, cycle, input, processing, output, and storage, um, then I think that that makes a lot of sense. The other thing um, to realize is when we talk about uh, the information processing cycle, going back to chapter one, there are also components of computers that go along um, with that. So you have input devices, processing devices, output devices, storage devices, communication and networking devices. So uh, components and hardware can also be thought of in terms of those same, those same definitions. Okay, and then one final idea, um, <clears throat> it's not in the book, but I want to I want to uh, discuss is when we talk about an information system, uh, we talk about <clears throat> what I call elements of an information system, and the ele elements of an information system uh, include the hardware and the software, which we talked about, so it's there. It also includes the data, which we've talked about, which is there, but it also includes the people that's the people that create the systems, the people that use the systems, the, the, the people that maintain the systems. So we got to have people when we talk about a system. So we don't want to forget about the people. And there has to be procedures. And when we think about all the things that have gone wrong with security and hacking and companies losing, you know, their credit card data, a lot of that, sure, it's because of a hardware or software problem or maybe a problem with the people, but um, often it's simply not having the right procedures in place. What's your backup procedure? What's your security uh, procedure? What's, you know, what's the procedure um, if the power goes out? You know, can, can your organization continue to function? So hardware, software, data. And then the two P's, people and procedures. So those are five elements of an information system that we will talk about and emphasize as we go through this course. All right, so I think that's a good introduction. I want to try to keep that to 30 minutes. It looks like I'm at about 32 minutes. So um, uh, I think a good first lecture. And um, we'll see you online.